Welcome to Public Affairs Roundtable, a discussion of current events in the nation and around the world and how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Law. National Journal, a nonpartisan research publication, says this when it lists Senator Dan Quayle, a Republican from Indiana, in the honorable mention list of rising stars in Congress. Senator Dan Quayle, a lion on Washington's social circuit, has also impressed many observers with his skills in defense and labor policy. Our guest today on Public Affairs Roundtable is Senator Dan Quayle, Indiana's junior senator, a former congressman from Indiana's 4th District, a lawyer, a newspaper man, uh, and uh, we'll talk about uh, what he is and what the issues are in Congress these days. Also with us today, John Rouse, who is executive producer of Public Affairs Roundtable. Welcome, Senator. I want to ask a question, I don't mean to be facetious, about the thing that National Journal talks about. It's about the image of Dan Quayle. I mean, obviously there's some, uh, some acceptance by the folks in Indiana. You've been reelected uh, to, the, to the Senate. Uh, but to call you a line on Washington's social circuit, <laughs> to have been compared to uh, Robert Redford in your looks, to, you know, to someone who's played on the, the, the pro-am uh, golf circuit. In fact, there's a lot of glamour in the job, and when you're in Washington, there's a lot of glamour associated with it. Uh, people Magazine might ask Sybil Shepard, do, do people have trouble taking you seriously because you're so beautiful, because of the glamour involved? And because of this social life, do, do people have trouble taking you seriously as a, as a senator? Ab absolutely not. I don't know where that, that comment came out of National Journal, who they talked to. It's interesting, a, a sort of a line on the social circuit, because uh, Dan Quayle in Washington is almost the antithesis of that. As you well know, and you know my family quite well, that uh, not only am I dedicated to my wife and my children, but I'm one of those people that absolutely shuns the so-called social circuit in Washington, D.C. I think it's absolutely obnoxious, to, quite, to put it quite bluntly. I think that the, the last thing that I want to do is to go to some uh, reception or go to some uh, dinner uh, that somebody's having in Washington. As a matter of fact, I don't do it. When the Senate closes down, which is uh, sometimes rather late at night, uh, I go straight home, and uh, that's where I want to be. As a matter of fact, some of my constituency criticize me for not going to their cocktail parties and their receptions at downtown Washington. Now, other members do it. That's fine. Uh, I don't. Uh, I just find it. I don't like it. Uh, I don't partake in it. And particularly if I'm going to try to be a, not only a good husband but a good father, you can't do everything, and uh, I've just drawn the line. I just do not partake in that, and I will not. You started your second term in the Senate now, and it says uh, many observers pressed, impressed many observers with skills in defense and labor policy. Is that where you look at your niche in, in the Senate, that that'll be the emphasis of, of your work? I think that uh, the defense and labor policies have consumed a lot of my time. I'm on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, the national security issues are... Uh, very detailed, uh, very complicated. Uh, it takes a lot of time to, to become uh, known as somebody that has a great deal of information about uh, arms control policies, about how we're going to equip uh, our uh, soldiers, uh, what is the proper balance, how much is enough, when is enough to, uh, to spend on uh, national security, how is the, the volunteer army, how is readiness, sustainability, how does this whole thing fit into the geopolitical situation. I spend a lot of my time there. I also spent a lot of time on the Labor and Human Resources Committee. As now the ranking member of the Labor Subcommittee, I have to spend a, a lot of uh, time on the so-called labor issues. And not because I particularly like to, but that is, happens to be the agenda of the Democrats in the Senate right now. Senator Kennedy and Senator Metzenbaum, who are in the majority of the committee, they have a, a different agenda than when Dan Quayle was the chairman of the subcommittee. When I was chairman of the subcommittee, we did a lot more things in employment and training and education. Uh, now that they're the, the chairman of the committees, uh, they're more interested on the agenda of the labor unions in Washington. Uh, so we have to respond to those. Uh, some are uh, good proposals, uh, some are not good proposals. But those are the two areas that uh, I have cut out a degree of expertise, and that is what I am known for uh, in the Senate, and I would say particularly uh, in the area of the employment and education, that's what I've done a lot of work uh, back here in Indiana. Did it take you a while to decide that's what you wanted to do, or when you went to, to, Senate, into, to Washington six years, oh, well, you were in Washington before that, but when you went to the Senate, uh, did you have pretty much in mind this, these areas you wanted to go to, or did you just gravitate in that direction? Well, I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House for two years, uh, my last two years, from 1978 to 1980. 
although in two years, and particularly in the House, you don't get that involved. In my particular situation, I was running for the Senate at that time, so I knew I wouldn't be back on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. I spent a lot of time uh, trying to get uh, well-known in 92 different counties and five and a half million people in the, in the state of Indiana. But uh, I was always been interested in national affairs and international affairs. Uh, that's one of the reasons I ran for the Senate, because I believe that the Senate offers me more of a forum uh, to talk about national security matters. Uh, I've also been very interested in productivity and very interested in the House of Representatives, where I served on the Small Business Committee, on how we can get uh, small businesses someday to perhaps be big businesses. That's what I use as a definition of a big business, is of what a small business will eventually become if they're allowed enough freedom and latitude and the government uh, won't harass them too much. Uh, so I've always been interested in, in productivity. Uh, one of the things to increase productivity that a lot of my business colleagues, and I was a businessman before this, I don't think appreciate enough, and that is the importance of training, uh, of education, of vocational education, of getting that, those skills transmitted to that labor force and to have that labor force educated so they'll have the flexibility to do a lot of different jobs. That to me, and it may sound a bit uh, different uh, coming from uh, somebody that has not been, or business people that perhaps don't spend enough time uh, in that area. I'm finding now more and more businesses are becoming involved in education and employment and training. They're finding out the utility of this. Uh, some of them are doing it because it helps the P&L statement. The profit and loss statement looks a lot better. Uh, others because they genuinely are interested in these kids and they're genuinely interested in these people and proving their skills. Uh, they want these people to go out and I tell a lot of my friends that they say, oh, well, you know, we're always concerned about the welfare cheaters. I say, well, let's not worry you know, about the welfare cheaters as much as we ought to figure out why they're on welfare in the first place. Let's figure out how we're going to get them off the welfare rolls. How are we going to give them education? How are we going to give them that opportunity? And that's where I've really focused a lot of my attention. And I have rather unique uh, relationships because, as a matter of fact, uh, legislation that I've introduced in the past, many of my co-sponsors of that are people like Senator Kennedy and others that normally don't uh, agree with me on these issues or on other issues like national security issues. Uh, Senator, if I could uh, take you back to the uh, defense issues, the strategic defense initiative called Star Wars, uh, most people think it will not work, that of course for the short term it does not replace MAD, mutual assured destruction, so in terms of that political process it, 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 does, not re it does not replace MAD for the short term. Some people are now saying that the real spinoffs from, from SDI will be the spinoffs, the, the fact that we'll learn so much from the technology and the exploration and so forth. So that's the first reason for SDI. In other words, that with this trillion dollar expenditure, the spinoffs are going to be the real product. The second thing in terms of this one trillion dollar expenditure for SDI is that what it will do, it will keep the Russians from competing with us economically. Is, are those, do those foci have any emphasis as far as you're concerned? Well, let me go back and try to, 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 to clear up and at least to state my premises, which are probably a lot different than the thrust of the, of the question. Uh, first of all, we're not afraid at all of competing uh, economically with the Soviet Union. I quite think Marxism is a dying uh, economy. Uh, I don't believe you're going to see uh, Marxism uh, being copied in too many places around the world. So I'm not... Uh, afraid to compete with a, an economic theory that has basically been repudiated and for all practical purposes is dead as a, as a competitor. Uh, the mutual assured destruction. Uh, mutual assured destruction is also a military theory uh, that has been much more in the past uh, than today. As a matter of fact, mutual assured destruction in the very essence of it assumes that uh, the United States and the Soviet Union will have enough uh, retaliatory forces in the Soviet Union's position and enough first strike capabilities to destroy our populations, uh, to destroy our cities. Well, I can tell you, and it's no secret that I'm letting uh, this out, uh, I guard uh, secrets of our nation very, very uh, carefully, uh, but uh, we target military targets. The Soviet Union targets military targets. Now, obviously, some cities may be military targets. So this uh, idea of mutual assured destruction that was came on in the early 1960s is really sort of a theory that's still out there and uh, a lot of people fuss about it so I don't believe that that is, and a matter of fact I can tell you for certainty, that is not the major thrust 
of our deterrence, which gives us a, the, the peace and stability that we, that we have today. Uh, also, the, the, the premise that uh, many people say uh, SDI won't work and that we're spending a trillion dollars. Well, this year's budget uh, calls for about four billion dollars. Uh, the trillion dollar figure is a figure that uh, I'm not exactly sure where that figure comes from, but it probably assumes the, the near perfect population defense at some time in the year 2030 or 2040. And by the time uh, you add that on and by the time we get there, we'll be in probably, you know, I don't know how many trillion dollars we'll be spending on defense, that uh, SDI right now is uh, about... 1% of the defense budget. So if we, anybody has the idea that we're spending a lot of money as a percentage of the national defense budget on SDI, I just take exception and don't think that 1% uh, is. Uh, as far as SDI working, and I think that's a very uh, important question that, that, that you raised and one that I think that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the Soviet Union knows that SDI has worked. They've got their own SDI system for all practical purposes within the terms of the ABM treaty, I might add, already deployed around Moscow. As a matter of fact, they've modernized it two times, the Galosh system. They're on their third generation ABM system, SDI system that is basically de deployed right around Moscow. Now, I believe that you will see eventually, despite all the criticism, uh, an SDI system uh, deployed in this country uh, within the next uh, several decades. I'd like to see a system deployed in the uh, er earlier, mid to 1990s. A lot will depend on the Congress, a lot will depend on the President. When I talk about an SDI system, I think that there's all of a sudden this feeling that you're going to come up with this near-perfect umbrella that's going to be put over the entire uh, continental United States with the exception of Alaska and Hawaii, and all of a sudden that we're going to be leak-proof from any kind of an attack by the Soviet Union. That is really way down the road, and quite frankly, I am not convinced that that kind of a system is, is doable. Uh, I've got some real uh, technological concerns, because I'll tell you what, once we resolve the ballistic missile threat, which we're concerned about now, that the Soviet ICBMs, which are ballistic missiles that can be launched from the territory of the Soviet Union and can strike at the heartland of America on a very prompt basis within a matter of minutes, not a matter of hours, is the threat that we have today. And SDI is going to be used uh, in the short term to try to counter that particular uh, threat. But once we take care of the ballistic missile threat, which I think is far more destabilizing because it's on the hair trigger type of situation, we're going to have a cruise missile threat. Now, you're going to have to have a different type of SDI. So I'm not one that is out there advocating SDI is going to, to be the entire near-perfect population defense system. But I do think that SDI in fact, can work. As I said, that the Soviets already have one that uh, is, is operational. Uh, I think that uh, you will find that defenses are going to be far more important in the future for a number of reasons. First, the American people really want to see and would rather have peace through the deployment of defensive systems rather than just having to rely only on offensive with, uh, systems and being able to respond only in kind when an attack may or may not come. That they would like to have peace and stability through putting their eggs in the basket of having defensive capabilities. SDI provides the capability to stop an attack once it happens by knocking down that missile. I find a great deal of support in the United States for that kind of concept. I find a great deal of support in this state of Indiana that people really want to see a genuine arms reduction of offensive weapons. Under SALT-1 and SALT-2, we have had an arms increase and an arms escalation. We've gone from about 1,800 warheads in 1972 when the first SALT treaty signed to now under the counting of SALT-1 and SALT-2, each side has over 8,000 warheads. Uh, that has not been an arms reduction. That has been an arms escalation under SALT-1 and SALT-2. If we're going to have a genuine arms reduction, I think you're going to have the arms reduction in somewhat sync as you're going to deploy some defensive capabilities as well. And you would have a far more stable world with fewer offensive weapons, some defensive capabilities. I can tell you that I would feel a lot safer at night. 
And you furthermore, talk, you talk, okay, you talk about peace and stability. Are we at an acceptable level vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets in terms of peace and stability now, uh, or must we always have this military adversary to keep things on balance? Must I mean, you're talking now about uh, a high level of, of of missiles. I mean, is there is there room? I mean, is there genuine uh, uh, optimism that in fact the situation is going to improve with lower levels of of these offensive weapons? Well, I think that there's optimism that the, the arms control process is moving forward. I think that there's optimism that we can, in fact, move from a situation instead of just relying on offensive weapons, that you can have a reduction in offensive weapons and an introduction of defensive weapons. But let me finish one other important point about SDI and the workability of it. Let us take an accident, an accident launching of a ballistic missile. Or let's say if a terrorist nation or another nation would get a hold of it, that uh, not necessarily the Soviet Union. But if you can recall when that Soviet submarine uh, about a year ago, less or a little less than a year ago, sunk off the coast of Bermuda, it had ballistic missiles on board. If in fact one of those missiles would have gotten loose and accidentally, no fault, uh, no intent, no provocation by the Soviet Union, actually gotten loose and hit the United States uh, of America, or target the United States of America. Gorbachev picking up the phone and calling Reagan saying, look, it's a mistake, it's an accident. I can tell you right now, we do not have the capability to hit that missile and to knock it down. Now, I'm not so sure everyone really appreciates that, that we don't have that capability. SDI on a limited basis would give us that capability in case of an accident or in case of a third world country. Now, as far as back to the, the, the peace and the stability, I think what you're asking, and you can interject if, if I'm wrong, you're just saying, how much is enough? I mean, how much do we have, how many missiles do we have to have uh, to have peace and to have deterrence? Uh, I assume that is the essence of your question. And I think that what we're trying to do uh, is to the Soviet Union is basically say, well, we're not going to get into this bean counting situation and say, well, just because you have a greater uh, ICBM force, particularly with the SS-18s and the SS-17s and the 19s, and now they're deploying a whole new generation of mobile missile, which is a clear violation of our past understandings with them, that that necessarily is going to, to give you the edge. Uh, they clearly have the edge in, in that particular category. But what the United States has got to do is to, to have what I call rough equivalents, uh, that you've got to have some balance, and that's why I think it's very important that we uh, get serious beyond the INF talks, the intermediate nuclear force talks that are going on in Geneva, and to really st start to focus on the strategic arms reduction talks, the START talks, because that is where you're really going to see an arms reduction that it will be genuinely accepted, I think, by the American people. Yeah, I, I think the point that Larry's making is that the Soviets need arms control so they can expand their economy. We need arms control so we can decrease our defense budget so the balance of payments will not be as bad as it has been in the past. Is that an assumption that you would make as well? No, not, not really. I, I think uh, the Soviet Union uh, can, in fact, uh, reduce uh, their d defense expenditures uh, any time they want to. I mean, they have 12 people, basically, in the Politburo. They don't have elections over there. If they want to decide to put more in their economy, uh, they can well do it, uh, but they don't. Uh, because, you see, the, re the reason that the Soviet Union is a superpower is not because of their economy. And I don't care how much money they put in that economy of theirs. They're not going to be a superpower because of their economy. The Soviet Union is a superpower because of their military capability. The Soviet Union will never give up that status of a superpower and will never relinquish the, undesi or the desired goal of putting as much money and continue to put money into that military industrial complex. On our side, as far as uh, helping out the, the balance of payments, I presume the balance of payments in, in, in the relationship to the trade, Right. Uh, well, I can only say this in, in response to that, is that uh, if we would take our balance of payments of trade and military procurement, we have a positive factor of about four to one. Uh, so if you want to, if that argument, I would just sort of turn on its face and say, well, we ought to spend all of it in the military because that would give us a very positive balance of trade. I don't think we want to do that, uh, and I'm not advocating that. But if we want to just take care of the balance of payment, put it in defense because that's where we have a balance of trade because people want our technology. Uh, we have a very favorable balance of trade. I don't, I'm not advocating that. I don't think that we want to do that. 
But uh, the Soviet Union is never going to give it up. Uh, Harold Brown, former Secretary of Defense under uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, said that uh, in relationship to the Soviet Union, when they spend, we spend. When we stop, they spend. I mean, they are going to spend and spend and spend and spend. Now, obviously, we can't afford, because of our political system, because of the way our economy is set up, uh, because of the allies, uh, to spend near the amount of money that the Soviet Union does uh, in national defense. But we have got to spend enough that they know that we are serious about preserving our security, about preserving our freedoms, and about maintaining treaties and alliances that we have around the world to say to the Soviet Union, go ahead, as long as you stay in your borders, that's your problem. But we're simply not going to, to just sort of unilaterally give you the world. If we can turn for a minute to budget and taxation matters, uh, and if I can be so bold as to quote the National Journal here again, something you said about uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, he has accomplished lower taxes and rebuilt the nation's defenses. This is before you, you had some critical remarks about some foreign policy matters, but, but in fact, he's accomplished lower taxes. Indiana, uh, since Ronald Reagan has been president, uh, Indiana has increased its sales tax, increased its income tax. Uh, many counties, uh, Delaware County among them, is on the verge of adopting a local income tax. Some of this in response to the fact that, that federal dollars back to the states has been cut. So he has perhaps accomplished a transfer of that taxation from the federal level to the local level. Is, is that what you're talking about? Is that, is that the goal to, in fact, put that, that taxation at the local level rather than the federal level? I think that the goal of uh, Ronald Reagan and the goal that I certainly am very philosophically sympathetic with is that uh, we believe, one, that lower federal taxes in particular uh, provide incentives, will increase productivity, and will increase jobs without unduly hurting uh, inflation. And I think that you've seen that. And I think uh, there have been a lot of critics. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I can remember even some questions that I have gotten in the, during uh, 1980 and 1984 saying, how do you all subscribe to this cutting taxes? Uh, isn't that going to be very inflationary? And I had to point out that it's not going to be inflationary, that it, what it's going to do is it's going to increase productivity, it's going to increase jobs. And I dare say with the, the latest economic reports that are coming out that it's done precisely that. Also, the goal of uh, lower tax cuts is to say that the United States government, federal government, uh, ought to try to level off its collection of revenues from uh, the people, uh, not at 24 or 25 percent of gross national product, but where it's been on a historic average for the last two decades of around 20 percent or 19 percent. You know, about 20 percent. Revenues right now at the federal government are about 19 percent. But spending is about 23 or 24 percent. Now, if you're going to get it in balance, obviously revenues would have to come up about 1 percent. Spending is going to go down about 3 or 4 percent. But the reason the president is so adamant on, on uh, raising taxes, and I think he's absolutely right, because once you raise taxes, then all the big spenders in Congress say, aha, now we got all this new money, we can go back to the old style of politics and just go ahead and spend it. It's not there to be spent. Furthermore, by getting government decisions, important decisions, back to the states and the local communities, they are far better to make that decision than some bureaucrat out in Washington, D.C. So I you know, applaud governors, mayors, local people taking the responsibility and saying, we need a certain amount of revenues to provide for these worthwhile projects. And by golly, it's a lot easier to control the money and see it spent well as long as you've got it right here. Even though they say general revenue sharing was a great scheme that uh, didn't cost uh, very much in administering the project. Let me tell you, it still costs a lot to have that dollar go from here out to Washington and come back on some formula basis. So keeping the decision making, and as the decision making goes also the responsibility to raise the revenues to do the certain things, and I think that that is also a very positive result. But hasn't that federal tax cut also contributed to the deficit and taken us farther and farther from this uh, balanced budget that Ronald Reagan promised us in 1980? Wrong because we are collecting about the same amount of revenues as we collected before uh, uh, the Reagan tax cut as a percentage of GMP, and that's about 19 percent. So if you go back and look and see how many revenues we were c c collecting before the Reagan tax cut, it's about the same as GMP. As a matter of fact, we are collecting about, don't hold me to it, about uh, $300 billion more in revenues with a tax cut than we were before the tax but cut. But we're still nowhere near a balanced budget. No, but the balanced budget, uh, uh, not being able to achieve a balanced budget is not because of uh, the American people paying fewer taxes than they have before. It's 
It's because the federal government is spending more than it's ever spent before. Senator, if I could uh, get to that same kind of issue. The post-Reagan right, political right, obviously next year is a presidential year for elections. What is? What are the conservatives, what's going to be the platform of the conservatives in the post-Reagan right in the future, uh, next year, for example? Well, I don't know if I can talk about the post-Reagan right, but let me just tell you what I think that the platform of the Republican Party is going to be. And okay. you can identify it however you, however you want to. I think that the, the platform will be uh, essentially this, that uh, what we've been able to achieve is peace and prosperity. And by achieving peace and prosperity, the, the Republicans are going to have to go out and to look forward on how we're going to be able to carry that, uh, to, to carry that on. I think one of the big issues that we're going to have, not only uh, in looking at peace first, the relationship with the Soviet Union, uh, progress or the lack of it or what we're doing in, in uh, arms control, uh, but more importantly, what are we doing in regional conflicts and the regional stability? One of the most intensely debated issues that's going to happen in 1988 uh, will be whether there will be support for the democratic resistance in Nicaragua and what we're going to do in entire Central America. The Republican agenda will be that we will be for human rights, democracy, whether it's the Philippines or whether it's South Korea or whether it's Nicaragua. And we are going to take those principles of freedom and say that takes strong leadership from a president, whether it's Ronald Reagan or whoever his successor will be. We will also talk about the economy and the economic agenda. Uh, we will be resisting increasing uh, to taxes. We will feel that that is not the way to, to increase productivity. Uh, the post-Reagan era will look on how we're going to really utilize, I think, uh, education job training. I know I'm going to be speaking out on that, and I believe I'll find it far more acceptance uh, within my political party than perhaps it has been before, because I think that the American people will be looking at what I call the compassionate element, and the compassionate element is very important, and uh, it's important in trying to, to, to help people. We've got to also realize that we are in a situation uh, on where what are we going to do uh, about the idea of all these new jobs coming on, how we're going to keep the unemployment rate low. And I don't think that we're going to do it by saying it's going to be more government. I think that we're going to, again, talk about the individual, about the people, and try to get it back on a decentralized basis. We're out of time with only about two dozen more issues we want to cover here. Thanks to our guest, Senator Dan Quayle, Indiana. Uh, also to John Rouse, our producer, for being with us here today. I'm Larry Law. Thank you for joining us. If you have comments regarding this program, please address them to John Rouse, Box 149, Muncie, Indiana, 47305. The producer for Public Affairs Roundtable is John Rouse. Associate producers are Bill Mosier and Mike Seaborg. This program is a production of University Media Services, the Department of Political Science, and radio and television stations on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana.